Good morning, Chowding. Can you hear me okay? I have to confess I had goosebumps when we were singing the last song. Chris, I have to confess I hadn't read the songs or didn't know the songs that we were going to have this morning. But I think you'll see why I got goosebumps when we were singing it, because you couldn't have picked anything better. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we are, as Doreen said, going to continue our series, God's Holy Nation. The week before last, Heather looked at inner holiness and centered our thoughts around Psalm 51. Last week, Tim looked at personal holiness and reminded us how 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that Christians should shape their lives around what pleases God. Hello, Alfie. I am not going to attempt anything quite as clever as Tim around technology, though. You'll be pleased to know. Um, This week, we're looking at corporate holiness, about creating and being a holy church. Something as a subject that I wondered initially how on earth I was going to tackle. But, you know, it's always good to start by looking at the Bible. See what the Bible has to say, what God has to say about things. So turn with me if you can and follow on an app or follow on the screen behind while we read from 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 10. The living stone and a chosen people. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So those are some of the verses that we will be thinking about and referring to as we think about God's holy church. And we will be thinking very much about the words words that were highlighted in red. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, we're going to be looking at quite a few references today from the Bible, as I really want to show you that what I'm saying isn't coming from here or from a book or wishful thinking, but from the Bible. How are we going to look at corporate holiness then? How are we going to look at being God's holy people together? I must admit, I asked myself the very same question. When you start thinking about holiness, you automatically think about individual holiness just like Heather and Tim did. And that's right. But you can't just look at individual holiness on its own as a separate thing from God's holy church. So we're going to look at God's holy church, but slightly differently. How? 
by reviewing the construction industry and how a building is built. Why? Why use this analogy? Because Paul in the Bible tells me I can. Ephesians 2, verse 21 onwards, when he is talking about us as individuals, Paul says, In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And remember, in our reading today, Peter said, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So, to liken ourselves to a holy building is, I think, a really good analogy. We are all together God's holy church, and we are being built into a holy building to the Lord. But I want to break this down into three parts to help you remember this when you get home and you're eating your Sunday roast, and you think, what was she talking about again? Uh... Right, so three points, easy for you to remember. One, foundations and a cornerstone. Two, bricks, mortar, and, th and three, mortar. So let's have a look at the pictures on our screen. Here, you can see some pretty wacky designs. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know whether I could actually get my head around living in a house that was designed like that. And I think we've got a couple more. I mean, look, I certainly would not want to be living in that one on the right. I don't do heights at the best of times, but that, does it look stable? Not sure. And then we've got another one. How weird does that look? When I was looking for, for building designs, I did not expect to come across that. And then you'll probably remember the next one. Oh, no, not this one. This, and that one. What's that one? The Leaning Tower of Pisa. So you can see, <laughs> there's a lot of different of buildings out there. But before we get started, I want to make something absolutely clear. When we are talking about making a holy church, I don't mean the renovations at the chapel. Okay, Important though they are, that's not what we're talking about. In the context that we are looking at today, we are talking about the church as a group of Christians doing life together. We are talking about me and about you sitting there. We're talking about the wider church, but also I want to make this about Chaldean. We are talking about making Chaldean a group of holy people together. Why? Why is that important? How we act and behave together as a church, why is that important? Because our church needs to be a beacon. It needs to be a beacon of light and hope shining out in the world so that others can come to share in the peace of forgiveness that Jesus has to offer everyone who comes to him. People aren't going to think about wanting to know God if the building looks pretty rough. We also need to think of our church as a lighthouse, shining out that beacon of light. It's said in our reading that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. A lighthouse shining this wonderful light cannot act as a beacon and be effective if it is crumbling and falling apart and if it's leaking bad stuff, toxic waste into the area around it. How our holy building, our lighthouse, is seen matters. You only have to look at the way the newspapers jump on any hint of scandal in a church to know that it can do so much harm to God's work if the building is not constructed properly. So we know what the purpose of the building is, to shine light, and we know why it's important to make it attractive and to set a good example but how do we go about building it? Well, the first thing you need is foundations. Well, think back to those pictures. One of the key things that matters is the foundation, something that the whole building is built on. 
The Leaning Tower of Pisa became just that, the Leaning Tower, because it was built on foundations that were too shallow and on the wrong type of subsoil that made the whole building totally unstable. So the first thing we need to look at is the foundation of our building. What should we base our church on? What should the foundation of our building be? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus himself talked about wise and foolish builders in Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. My kids used to love singing, you know, the wise man built his house, and the best bit was the (laughs) at the end. They loved that. Jesus said that the foundation was hearing his words and putting them into practice. But if we don't do that, (laughs) we too will crash. Jesus Christ has to be the foundation of our church, the central belief that he was the perfect son of God who came to save all those who believed in him and asked him to forgive everything that they have ever done wrong. If we try and build our church on anything, anything other than this simple truth, it's going to start toppling over and won't stand the test of time. If we try and build it on tradition or just doing good stuff for folk, or making it a social group that meets of bacon sandwiches and tea and cake. Well, that's all very nice and friendly, but it simply won't work. Just like the hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, before modern-day building practices came in, think what you will of them, the way that the buildings of history were built had as part of the foundation process the laying of the cornerstone. Now, I've heard a lot about cornerstones when I've been growing up, and the verses in the Bible are quite familiar to to me. But what exactly is a cornerstone? Well, I did a bit of research and found some pictures of cornerstones in buildings and found out what their purpose was. You can see. A cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid on the structure of the foundation, with all the other stones in the building laid in reference to it. It marks the geographical location by orientating the building in a specific direction. Think about it. It's often the first stone laid on the foundation and it orientates the building in a specific direction. It clearly said in our reading, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The writer is referencing Jesus Christ as that cornerstone. Not only is he and his teachings the foundation on which our holy building is to be built, but he also directs and orientates our building in the right direction. If we have anyone or anything else as our cornerstone other than Jesus and his teachings, our building is going to go in the wrong direction, become wonky and unstable and eventually fall, possibly hurting a lot of people in the process. We need to be following him and his teachings as opposed to what everyone else thinks or what's popular right now. Have you ever played Jenga? We play it a lot in our family at Christmas and birthdays and things. And it's a bit like playing Jenga. Our family are really good at cheating at it, by the way. Just putting that out there. But you get your stack of bricks, don't you? And then there's that one brick 
the really crucial one. You pull it out and the whole lot falls. Well, that's a bit like the cornerstone. That's a bit like if you pull Jesus and his teachings out. If you pull out that one vital stone, the whole structure collapses. And that is the same with Jesus. It will collapse without him there. So we've got the foundation and we've got the cornerstone, two very essentials. But now we need our bricks. What are the bricks in our holy building, our lighthouse? They are us. They are us. They are Audrey and Katie and Alison and Colin and Derek and Malcolm and you and you and you and you. It is each and every one of us that makes up this church. But hang on a minute. We cannot just have any old buildings, any old bricks in our holy building, you know, in our lighthouse. They've got to be perfect bricks. They need to be good quality. In my research, I discovered that bricks that have not been made properly with the right materials and fired properly can crumble and cause a building to fall. So you, as the bricks, need to be perfect. You need to be perfect. I see we've got a bit of a problem here. We aren't perfect, and I speak for myself here. I can see some of you thinking, well, that's ruled me out for a start. I can't be a brick in this church. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've done or how I've lived. Well, have you ever heard that little saying that goes and does the rounds from time to time? Consider this. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer with a stutter. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a flirt and Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran away from God. Job went bankrupt. And John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples fell asleep while praying. The Samaritan woman was divorced five times. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, and that is what some of you were. And that is what some of you were. But you are washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That is what some of you were. You are just the type of bricks that we need in our holy building, our lighthouse, providing you've been washed in a special coating, one that is only provided by Jesus and only if you ask him for it. Have you? Have you asked him for it? Peter says that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Two things struck me as I was preparing for today. One was that the cornerstone was right there in amongst the bricks, experiencing the same weather as the other bricks, the heat of summer and the cold of winter, the rain and the sunshine and the storms and gales too. Isn't that a comfort? Jesus is in our church with us all of the time, going through stuff with us, the good and the bad. And the second thing, that all the bricks are needed in the building. Some hold the roof up, some are at the base supporting the other bricks, and some bricks are just in the middle next to all the other bricks. But they're all needed. Even if you take one brick out the middle, it impacts on the other bricks around it, making them work harder and potentially making the building unsafe. 
So we should never say that we are not important. We should never say that we're not necessary. Each brick has a purpose. Each brick has a responsibility. And each brick is needed. So we've got a foundation and we've got our cornerstone, so we're pointed in the right direction, and we've got our bricks for our holy building, well, what else do we need? If we just put the bricks together and leave them like that, they will eventually become loose, fall out, and the building will fall. We need mortar. But again, the wrong mortar consistency can be hazardous for a building. If it is mixed together incorrectly, even missing one component, it can cause serious chemical issues with shrinkage, and it can be affected badly by heat and cold. It will crumble, and it will flake away and cause bricks to fall away and make the whole building, again, unstable. What mortar should we be using? Well, I put together the recipe here. This is the recipe, the formula for good mortar that is found in the New Testament. I've put it on a recipe card. Hopefully, you can, yes, you can. You can see it. The ingredients for our mortar are listed in Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. and involves a whole lot of fruit, not something normally found in mortar. The fruit that you need to put in our mortar is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the instructions for mixing together the ingredients is found in Ephesians 4, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And you know you sometimes get at the bottom of a recipe card for best results? So for best results, use Ephesians 5. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Can you imagine, can you imagine for one minute how beautiful and strong and secure our holy building here will be if we stick our bricks together with that mortar? How bright our lighthouse could shine with the bricks planted on top of a strong foundation and guided by a cornerstone. So as I conclude and I ask the band to come back up, let me leave you with some thoughts. Are you making yourself part of God's holy building here at Chaldean? Are you saying being part of his building, well, that doesn't really matter, it's not important, it's not my top priority. Do you look at your fellow bricks beside you and think, I don't want to be stuck next to them? Do you show love to your fellow bricks? Do you forgive your fellow bricks? Do you say good things about your fellow bricks? Do you think, I can't be a brick because I'm not good enough? Think again. Do you think I'm not an important brick? Well, remember, we are commanded by God. All of this isn't optional, you know. This is a commandment, and God says that we are commanded to be like living stones being built into a spiritual house and that we are to be a royal priesthood. But if we are to build a holy building, a holy church of God's people, we want it to shine. But we can only do that if we shine together. Let's just have a quick prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to be your living stones. Help us to build our church on your foundation and be guided by you as our cornerstone. And help us to mix that mortar so well that it sticks us together as bricks in your holy building. I ask this in your name. Amen. Now we've got two songs that I've requested to follow up, one which you haven't had before. They're both good stomping good uns, okay? So none of this sitting looking holy and contemplative at the end of the talk. If you're physically able, I want you on your feet.
Okay, because the first one talks about, yes, you are good enough to be a brick because you're saved. And the second one is, well, you're a brick. Well, let's get on and walk. So come on, on your feet. Thank you.